Hello, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, hi to anyone watching on Facebook Live and, and also to anyone on the Zoom and, and to anyone watching this in the future. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is How to Cut College Costs Part Two. As promised, we have a part two to the uh, How to Cut College Costs webinar that we held about a month ago. There's a lot more to talk about. Um, and so we wanted to make sure to, uh, to get to to more questions that that the uh, the families that we work with have, um, and we have a very special guest joining us today. Very excited to to welcome her. So, uh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is William Jackie, and I am a independent educational consultant, and I also work as the academic coordinator for Strive to Learn here in Southern California. Um, and today, we are very lucky to be joined by uh, financial aid expert Pamela Walker. Um, Pamela, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me today, tonight. Um, I'm really excited about sharing information with um, your families. And um, well, again, my name is Pam Walker and I have been in the financial aid field for over 25 years. Um, I started out many years ago in the I would say mid early nineties and started working for private college um, and doing financial aid started in a sort of a administrative role. And, um, but I've worked at a number of different colleges, both private and um, public schools in the state of Massachusetts because that's where I was originally from. And um, so just, did all kinds of different things, working with families, helping them find the, the best way to pay for college and, um, you know, just getting the best uh, financial aid package to them. And um, so work, worked with all different types of students and all different walks of life. So it was very, very interesting. Currently, um, what I do is I, I retired from working in the college life um, in 2016, and I now currently teach at the University of Irvine, um, at University Irvine, and um, also UCLA, and I teach financial aid to future college counselors. So I'm still very much a part of the financial aid world. And uh, and full disclosure, um, Ms. Ms. Walker was actually my my instructor for uh, for one of my classes, and uh, I can say she taught me everything I know about financial aid. Uh, and that was a great class. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much. We're we're really grateful to have you, and really excited uh, that you can join us and and share your your experience and and your knowledge. Um, so I want to get right into some uh, topics related to financial aid, and um, you know I have a lot of questions I want to ask. Uh, Pamela, but I actually want to um, start by kind of just going over something that's very uh, relevant for our students at Strive to Learn who are in Southern California, and that is the Western Undergraduate Exchange Program. Um, and so it's what is called a tuition uh, exchange program or a tuition savings program. They have a similar thing on the East Coast, but we're not going to talk about that uh, today. Um, I, I'd be happy to share more information um, after the webinar to anyone who, who does have questions about that uh, East Coast program, if we have anyone tuning in on the other side of the country. But um, I do wanna talk about the Western Undergraduate Exchange a little bit because it's something that, um, you know, in my practice with students, uh, parents have a lot of questions about, students have questions about. It's something that I, I bring up a lot with, with my students and introduce them to. So I kind of just wanna go over to, uh, for a few minutes, some basics of that. Um, so I have some slides I'm gonna share here briefly. Just a couple slides, just some information that I think would be uh, really relevant for anyone to know who is not familiar with this program, and even some who maybe know a little about it, you might learn something new. Um, so it's, again, it's called the Western Undergraduate Exchange. A lot of times you will hear it uh, spoken as WUE, uh, and that's because of the abbreviation WUE. So a lot of times we just say WUE, like WUE schools, the WUE program. And it, but that's what it means is the Western Undergraduate Exchange. And what it is, is a, an agreement that uh, 16 member states and territories that make up the WICHE came to. Um, that's the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. 
Um, so these 16 states and territories uh, came together and decided to offer this program to students. And what the program does is it provides savings on non-resident tuition at 160 and uh, more than 160 public colleges and universities on the West Coast. And that also includes some junior colleges, by the way. Um, so in other words, this is a program for students who are residents of other states on the West Coast. To give you an example for the, the California residents that I work with most frequently, um, they cannot apply to California schools and get a WUI um, saving uh, tuition discount, but that's because they're, they're residents. So this is strictly for schools where you would be a non-resident. So for my California students, they're applying to colleges in states like Oregon and Washington and uh, Arizona and Colorado. Um, so what it does is it allows eligible students uh, who meet the requirements to pay no more than one and a half times what the resident tuition rate is at those particular uh, colleges and universities, which is very good savings because the gulf between resident and non-resident tuition at, at a lot of public uh, universities is, is pretty wide. Um, it's a pretty wide gap. And so one and a half times, it may sound, it may not sound like uh, you know, it may, it may not sound like you're paying the resident rate and you're not, but you are paying something that's relatively close to it. And it's generally a pretty big savings on the non-resident tuition rate. Um, anywhere from 10,000 to 17, 18,000 is what I usually see as of a discount annually. So, so it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good option. It's a really cool program. It's something that I recommend to a lot of students who want to stay on the West Coast, or at least are looking at West Coast schools. Um, in most cases, there's no extra application required. Um, there are exceptions, though. Um, and that's a common theme when we're talking about the college application world. Um, there are exceptions, and it depends on the school. Um, so I would recommend checking each specific school's policies to, to make sure whether they uh, have an extra application, or if it's just a box that you have to check on on their, you know, main application. Um, there is no universal WUI application, uh, by the way. This is something that each college um, deals with differently. So, uh, but in most cases, you don't have to do an extra application. You just have to apply to the the college. There are some uh, additional requirements, but they vary. Um, they are, you know, they're different across the board. So again, you have to just kind of check individual colleges to to see what their requirements are. Some of the requirements might be a minimum GPA, um, some of which are pretty reasonable, like the University of Hawaii, others which are um, a little tougher to meet and have higher, um, higher marks. And an example would be Colorado State. Um, another requirement would be applying to specific majors. An example of this, a pretty extreme case of this is the University of Arizona which technically does participate in the WUI program, but there are only two majors that, that uh, students can apply to and, and get the WUI discount. And they are nat natural resources and um, mining engineering. So very, very specific majors. Um, so for most students, it's, it's as if University of Arizona is not a WUI school. Um, and also an earlier application deadline is sometimes a thing that, that you might need to, um, to deal with if you wanna apply for WUI. Um, Again, just check the requirements depending on which schools you're applying to um, on the West Coast. So just a few notable WUI schools, uh, University of Utah, Colorado State, Boise State, um, Arizona State. However, that's strictly for the, the downtown, the Phoenix and the Polytechnic campuses, not for the, the main Tempe campus. Uh, and then Oregon State and Portland State. And then there are some notable admissions, some schools that are public uh, universities on the West Coast that a lot of students apply to and um, are really great schools. And unfortunately, they don't participate in the program, including University of Washington, University of Oregon, and University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and so I've included a link here, um, and, and we'll share these slides later um, for anyone that would like to, um, to visit this site. The WUI Savings Finder is a good subsection of the WUI website where you can actually search for, uh, you can search by, by region, um, you can search by major. It's, it's a really great um, sort of search function and database, and it will allow you to see what the requirements are for each individual college. And you can also just see the full list of which colleges participate. So overall, it's, it's a program that I highly recommend. Um, to kind of summarize my thoughts on it, it's something I recommend to students who um, want to stay on the West Coast, are open to going out of state, and are open to uh, 
public universities. And by the way, they're, they're not all large public universities. There are some smaller schools uh, as well and some kind of more unique schools that, that are in the program. So um, if, if affordability is a factor, I definitely recommend looking into Western undergraduate exchange uh, schools. Okay, so um, now I want to talk about some other things, and and here I want to um, I want to ask uh, I want to ask Pamela, uh, you know, for her for her experience on these things. Um, first off, I want to I want to talk about deadlines. Um, this is something we touched on a little bit in uh, in part one, but I, I have a couple questions that we didn't get to. So I'm wondering, Pamela, um, you know, you have early action, you have early decision, you have regular decision, and you even have priority deadlines. So I'm wondering, first off, a student who applies to regular decision deadlines, is that student losing out on any opportunities to get more financial aid than students who apply early action or early decision? You know, does that money run out for the regular decision students? No, not, no, it doesn't. Um, Schools generally have an idea of how much, how much funding they need for each of those areas. Of course, right, uh, early action and early decision, they usually have a similar deadline. Um, as you know, um, early decision means that the student can only look at that one school and will be unable to compare financial awards with other schools. They just can't because they are doing an early decision. But with regular decision, I know people are fearful that they're, that schools may run out of money, but in most cases, no, they would not. They would have funds ready and able for, for the students. Um, William, you mentioned priority deadline date, and I do want to mention, I want to tell you what that means. In any school that I ever worked at, we always had a priority deadline. That means having the student get, you know, and they're not doing early action or early decision. So let's separate that. But priority means get your paperwork. You've um, applied you've, to, um, you've completed the FAFSA application, you've submitted that, and any other documentation that the school requires, they want you to get it in by that priority deadline. So once you do, and you're one of the early birds, you're gonna be the first in line for the school to review and award you. So that's that priority deadline is what that means. Um, uh, but like I said, regular decision, I know it seems like a long way off, but it won't be, they, they will have funding. They will have funding, so. And is there any, um... Is there any drawback to applying um, early decision, let's say, when it comes to financial aid? Well, it does. I mean, early decision, the way I look at it is if a, if a family is going to require um, financial aid, a great deal of financial aid, especially regular decision, I mean, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, um, early uh, decision may not be the right path to go because if you only have that one school to look at and you're gonna need financial aid, you may not even get as much financial aid as if you applied regular decision. So that could be a, you know, a possibility too. Mm -hmm. And as the saying goes, it all depends on the school. So schools have different ways of doing things. So you can't pinpoint it, but um, yeah, that's, um, yes, so. Thank you. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, great. So, you know, I want to ask about another topic. Um, I want to ask about scholarships. Um, now, do you, um, do you have any advice for students who are planning to seek out uh, private scholarships? Do you have any, any resources you recommend or just kind of any, um, you know, advice that you might share based on your experience? Yes, I do. And um, I actually have a, a, um, a short PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to share with your viewers and, um, and give you an idea of um, how some of it works. So Great. awesome. Just give me one minute while I get this. Okay, here we go. 
So, um, you know, everyone asked me, should I be applying for scholarships? And yes, and some people are saying it's a waste of time because you're always looking for them and you may not get any or you get very little. But I want to offer some um, tips and just some information about how scholarships work. And I do want to throw in that well, I'm going to start off by talking about college awarded scholarships because there are different kinds. So um, there are the different kinds, and I call them categories. But one, one that everyone might be familiar with is they're called merit scholarships. And these are generally based on academics, meaning they require a certain GPA and um, a test score, you know, a certain level of test scores. Um, but, all, but not all scholarships are given to straight A students. So that's the other thing I want to assure parents, especially everyone thinks that you have to be a straight A student to get a scholarship and that's really not the case. Um, the other types of merit scholarships are given to students who have a skill, like musical skill, um, they have a talent, and of course we know about the athletes, so that, that's another type of scholarship. And scho merit scholarships can even be given to students um, for recruitment purposes, uh, such as creating um, more geographic diversity. And I can tell you that my son was one of those. Um, he received a scholarship and it's because the school wanted to pull more Northeastern students down into Florida. So that's a definite possibility. The one thing you need to be careful of, is there a separate uh, type of scholarship, uh, sorry, an application? Make sure that if you have to apply using a certain application that you know of those, um, you know about the application. Scholarships can also come in the form of need-based and these are usually referred to grants. Um, I need to step back a moment. Merit scholarships usually are given by the admissions office, admissions office during the admission process. So that, um, so as the, uh, um, the admissions counselor is looking at that student's file, they will determine if that student is eligible for a merit scholarship. And now the need base comes out of the financial aid office. This means that the student is awarded funds based on the family's financial profile and, can and it can also require GPA and test scores, but in most cases it's based on need. Um, colleges need to fill their freshman class and may have different standards and accept students who have good grades, but not necessarily be at the top of their class. All right, so let me give you some tips. Um, carefully review the admissions materials so you know what you have to do in terms of, is there a separate application? Get to know the admission counselor. And I tell this to just about everybody, this is really important. Get to know the admission counselor that is signed to, the, to your student and find out what types of merit-based scholarships are available and the requirements for those. Now, the schools are pretty transparent about what types of merit scholarships they have, and they put those on their websites, but there may be some that aren't listed. So find out what those type of merit scholarships are. The admission counselor can be the best advocate for your student because if they feel you really need it, but they might be some pushback from someone else, they can go in and advocate for your student in order to get that scholarship. Are there opportunities for returning students? So everyone thinks you have to all, do all the searching for scholarships before you get to college, but believe it or not, there are plenty of scholarships while the student is in school as well. So after a year, you become a returning student 
And there are plenty of scholarships that are created by the alums. Um, they may, you know, there's just different areas like that. So there's great opportunity for those returning students. Um, are there, op uh, it, let's see, um, are the scholarships, the other things they want to know is find out is, are scholarships renewable? So here's the requirement. Do you have to keep a certain GPA, but know what all the requirements are um, if you're taking a specific major, but then all of a sudden the student um, changes their major mid, you know, while they're in school, um, they may lose that scholarship. So make sure you know all the requirements of that particular merit scholarship that that student has received. So the other item you want to know is how do colleges handle outside scholarships? And I'll talk about those in a second. And um, do they reduce the grant funds that were given to you dollar for dollar? So if you've earned an outside scholarship of let's say $2,000, are they going to take that $2,000 and reduce their, the school's grant funds to replace it with the outside scholarship? So, and a lot of schools do that. So you wanna make sure, um, will they use the funds to fill the gap? A gap is what wasn't, um, is the difference between the cost of attendance and financial aid. So is there a gap? Um, I'm, excuse me, the need and financial aid. Okay. So private scholarships or what we call outside scholarships, um, is another category and ones that have a sponsor and who determines who is eligible. Um, generally, there are specific requirements and could be based on need. So there's, there's a whole lot of things you need to look into. Now, who is considered an outside sponsor? So he, I've listed up here what some of the sponsors could be, the parents, a grandparent, employer, a student employer, so if they're working at a grocery store, do they offer scholarships, clubs and organizations, any religious affiliations, the student's high school, is the high school always during the springtime will have students apply for local scholarships, the Veterans Administration and the local community. So those are just some of the outside sponsors. So now tips on keeping um, the student organized. And this is very important because um, students can say, oh, there's so much I have to do, so much I have to look at. The one thing about doing scholarships, the earlier they start, they be the better. So even if you get them started in their freshman year, have them keep track of the kinds of scholarships you, that you can create a spreadsheet and have them keep track of the specific scholarships that they're interested in, the website, the due date, all that. Due dates are really important because if you miss it, you won't get it. So, um, so you wanna keep them well, organi well organized, especially if they have a number of schools. And in today's world, students don't apply to one or two schools anymore. It can be up to 20, so it's, it's quite a few. Um, will there be an essay that the student will need to write? Will there be a project that they will have to build? You need to know what is the, on the essay, is there a limit to the specific number of words? And in terms of the project, um, is there a certain dimension or size? to keep that you need to be specific. Cause you know, if the essays even goes over one sentence, again, it may get kicked out. So you want to keep track as to what, um, what the very, re what the requirements are, excuse me, sorry. So finding scholarships. Um, as you may already be aware, there are plenty of scholarship websites. Google the word scholarships and hundreds and thousands of, of uh, websites will come up. 
But the problem you run into is which one of the scams and which ones aren't. So what I, um, I've listed here some links to get you started. College Board is a great place to start. There are other websites, but these I feel comfortable with. Scholarships.com, finae.org, scholarships, and FastWeb, which is very popular. It's been around. A student fills out a profile about themselves. And then um, as scholarships come in that fit that profile, the student will be alerted to the fact that, hey, here's some scholarships you might be interested in applying for. Okay. Other, um, there are some college specific scholarships and that would be um, the ones you see listed here, meritaid.com and capex.com. These are, uh, you can go on there, look at a college that you're interested in and see what types of scholarships they have. And we can't forget about state scholarships. Um, the, I think people forget that the state offers quite a, quite a bit of good resources in terms of grants and scholarships. So if you know your um, state, you can go onto the state website and you can find out what types of uh, scholarships are available to the student. And some of them are pretty good. Some states do a very, very good job about this. Some don't, but most of them do offer some good scholarships. And again, there may be a separate application re um, required for the state fund, state types of scholarships. So um, what you should need to be aware of, and the, this is important, um, scholarship checks from a donor are usually sent to the college finance offices and called the bursar's office. Um, the donors may require the student to supply college bills, financial aid statements, grade reports, or proof of registration before they mail the check. So the student is one you know, from an organization and now they're getting ready to um, send the check. Some monies may not be sent until after the first semester. So they need to attend the first semester and that's when you know they have to show grade reports and all that to the donor and then they will send the money the second semester. So again, you need to be aware of that. So when you're figuring out a budget on how you're gonna pay for college, that's something you need to consider. Um, Again, is the scholarship renewable? And if so, what are the requirements? Certain GPA, certain major. Um, how will the financial aid office again handle outside scholarships? Will they deduct the grant dollar for dollar? Will they use it to fill the gap? So those are just some of the things to be aware of. And now for some final tips start the scholarship search early. I really suggest it because there's a lot of work. It's a big commitment for a student and um, it requires um, diligence and constantly going in and trying to find these scholarships. Organize your search, who, when, and where. Have a team of people who can offer constructive feedback on your written essays. Create a portfolio of students' interests and accomplishments. When searching for scholarships on the web, include words or phrases to narrow down your search. So when you're, when you're on the Google and you wanna search, if you put in foundation, grants, or major, it's really gonna break it down into um, smaller groups and you'll be able to find exactly what you're looking for. And don't overlook the um, scholarships with smaller amounts. They really can add up. That is it for scholarships. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. That's uh, a lot of helpful information. Um, yeah, really good stuff to know. Okay, awesome. So um, I actually want to switch gears slightly and, and go on to another topic uh, again, and, and that is uh, loans. Um, 
So loans is something we didn't get to talk about during part one at all. And it's, and it's very relevant, uh, you know, to just about everyone. Um, so, you know, just, just some questions I have about loans. Um, what are the main differences between the federal and private loans? Okay, well, federal loans come obviously from the federal government and um, have a fixed rate um, that can change every, well, it does change every year. And actually it dropped, thankfully, this year. Private loans, um, some have fixed, fixed interest rates, but some have the variable weight. So they could say, here it is, you know, 5.5%. And then mid-year, uh, depending on the economy, it, the interest rate could go up and they will, you know, it will go up to that. So it does have, um, a, you know, unfortunately, a little bit more flexibility in how the interest rates. With a private uh, scholarship, uh, sorry, private loan, um, the student would be the borrower, but they, the parent or someone would have to be a qualified co-signer because the student can't take out a private loan on their own. And it's highly recommended that the student use federal loans first, first before going into private loans because it can be so much more costly doing the private versus the federal. Do students have to, um, so students don't have to have a co-signer for federal loans? No, they Only do private. not. Okay. No, they, they, they're automatically approved for the um, subsidized and unsubsidized student loans. Mm -hmm. um, what about a credit check? Would, would students have to do a credit check in either case, federal or, or private? Private would have a credit check. Mm -hmm. And um, so they do the income to the, um, they do a debt ratio. And, um, and that would be mainly on, well, the student, if the student's not working, they have no you know, they don't have any um, credit so far, but for the parent, they will check that out. They will check out the credit for the parent. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and now, you know, going a little deeper into uh, federal loans. So um, can, what are, the, what are the differences between uh, direct subsidized and direct unsubsidized loans? The direct subsidized loan is based on need um, and the interest is paid by the government while the student is, school, is in school at least half time. The unsubsidized loan is not based on need. So anyone is eligible to receive the unsubsidized loan, even if you're a Bill Gates, you can get an unsubsidized. But the interest begins to accrue as soon as the loan begins to be dispersed to the school. And that's where that can add up. So um, over time, but um, so subsidized is based on need and unsubsidized is not based on need. Is it possible that, um, that a student would be offered both kinds of loans, subsidized and unsubsidized? In most cases, yes, they will be. So depending on the need that the student has, the subsidized, so as a freshman, you would receive $3,500 in subsidized loan and $2,000 in unsubsidized loan. So back in 2008, when um, the loan, uh, loan uh, was going crazy, um, it, the government, and the Congress created uh, or allowed students to borrow an additional 2,000. So every year they can get 2,000 in unsubsidized, but the subsidized will change as they go into di different grade levels. So as a freshman, they get 3,500. As a sophomore, they get 4,500 and so on. But um, yes, yeah, so they will get both. Unless there are no loan school, then you don't get, you're not offered loans. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. Um, now also in terms of federal loans, there are, there's something called a plus loan. Um, and 
I know yes. that there are different um, kinds of plus loans, right? Is, is now is a plus loan for a student or for a parent or both? Or? It's both. Okay. So the plus loan for the parent would be um, it, it's a parent who has a dependent student. Um, so they can apply for the parent, the, the, it used to be called the parent plus loan, I mean, which it is, but it's called the parent plus loan, the direct plus loan. Mm -hmm. The other plus loan is the grad plus loan. So if a student goes um, on to graduate school and the um, student loan is not enough, the federal loan is not enough, they, the student can apply for a grad plus loan. And, um, and of course, uh, again, this is for a graduate student, but um, generally what, I, I don't know exactly who all of your audience is, but most likely it would be the plus loan for the parent of a dependent student. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a credit, there is no, what they do is they look at your debt, the, your history, your credit um, in terms of, are you paying on time? Are you paying your bills on time? It is one of the easiest loans for parents to get. Um, and you can't be, um, you can't be in bankruptcy or anything like that. You will, you won't be approved, but in most cases, parents are approved as long as you're paying your bills on time and things. Yeah. You have a good credit history. So some things that, um, that I've heard before, and I'm wondering uh, how much truth there are um, to these, these statements. Um, one is that you can borrow an unlimited amount when it comes to parent plus loans, and the other that the interest rates can be very high. Are either or both of those things true? Um, the first one is not. You cannot borrow more than the cost of attendance. So the parent can borrow um, up to the cost of attendance minus any financial aid. So that's a, there is a limit on how much they can borrow. The interest rate, thankfully, came is has come down this year. It was 7%, a little over 7% last year, and is now um, a little above 5%. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact percentage in front of me. And, um, and again, it's a fixed rate for that particular year, but for the academic year, but it can go up and down. And um, it caps at 10%. I think that's the cap. For the student loan, it can't go any higher than 8%. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, and so, it, you know, it, it, if you're a parent, it kind of gives you something to think about, um, you know, definitely something to consider. Um, in light of your budget and, and sort of just in light of, um, you know, what, what you would consider affordable. Um, probably not something to, to rush into, I would imagine. But then again, you could say the same thing about any of these decisions with financial aid, something you definitely want to think through. When it, when it comes to the Parent PLUS loan, parents really do need to think, especially if they have their first child going off to school, but you have other ones coming up that are going to want to attend school. And um, so you want to be careful how much you borrow because it does add up very quickly. And then when you go into repayment, you know, again, it can be 25, 30 years before these loans are paid off. Um, especially if you're not paying the interest schools, parents can defer paying the plus loan while the student is in school, but they need to remember that the interest will continue to accrue during the time the student is in school. So paying the interest while the student's in school is something I recommend, especially for a student that has an unsubsidized, pay the interest while you're in school at least so that it keeps the actual, actual overall cost of borrowing down. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways that parents can figure and I, you might even be asking me this, um, what is, how much should a parent borrow or a student borrow? And they, you shouldn't borrow more than what you think your first year's salary should be. That's one guidance. But um, if, 
for example, a student is interested in going into being an elementary school teacher. Um, it's not the most, it's not the highest paying job in most states. So you don't wanna borrow um, so much money. I've heard uh, teachers borrow up to $100,000 and they haven't even gone to grad school yet to go to a school they really wanted to and to be a teacher, which is thank, you know, we love our teachers for sure, um, but have $100,000 in debt is not, it, yeah, it's not the right thing to do. So you really wanna balance it out you, for sure. And when you're thinking about that, think past the first year. So you, here's what it's gonna cost me for the first year. What is it? And then two, three, and the fourth year, what is it gonna cost me? Yeah, and so th this sounds like it's something that's true, um, you know, in the case of the student loans, um, definitely, you know, and, and, I, and I, I think that's what you're referring to, but, you know, having kind of thinking ahead a little bit and thinking about what is the career market for the field I'm interested in going into, um, you know, based mm -hmm. on your major as a student, what, what's my outlook? You mentioned a good example, which is a uh, teacher, you know, um, and, I did that path personally. Um, you know, I have a teaching credential, and um, yeah, uh, anyone who's a teacher in the audience, uh, yeah, we all know it's it's not the most lucrative career. Uh, most of us are doing it for, I mean, I would imagine hopefully all of us are doing it for the passion and love of working with students. But um, you know, there there are other careers where you might be expecting, um, you know, a relatively higher income, not too far out of getting your bachelor's degree or, you know, maybe if you are, are going on to do graduate school or, or law school or, or medical school and you're anticipating, you know, a, a large paycheck at the end of the rainbow, so to speak, um, you know, and that's a case where maybe you would feel a little more um, open to, uh, to taking on bigger loans, um, student loans. So, yeah, just uh, I'd like that you bring that up a lot because that's, you know, definitely something it's think about, you know, when, when we were 18 years old, uh, 17, 18 years old, um, you know, it's, it's hard to understand the consequences of something like taking out a loan and interest that accrues over time. And it's just one of those things that's very hard to understand until you experience, uh, experience it yourself. But, you know, um, you know, any students who are listening, uh, high school students, um, definitely take, take this to heart. Um, it doesn't hurt to think about, you know, what, what the potential career outlook might be in, in the field that, that you want to go into. Um, and if you don't know, that's okay. Um, you know, I know a lot of students, maybe even most students don't know um, the exact career field they want to go into, but, um, you know, think about your interests, think about the majors that you're considering, uh, the type of work that you might be willing to do. It, um, I still recommend, you know, that type of thought process, um, you know, before considering large student loans. Um, Exactly. And what I, what I like about the federal loan is they are limited to how much they can borrow each year. Mm -hmm. So that's a guideline. That's a really good guideline. It's when you have to tap into private loans and you can borrow, of course, more. And, um, it, you know, that's not always the, the best path to go. Um, federal loans, at least there's a limit and um, you can be assured that that's affordable for most students when you graduate and you have 27,000, you know, I'm gonna throw that number out, 27,000. That's affordable for most students um, once they get into the work, field, work world, so. Great, yeah, and so I have just a, just a couple more questions about loans. Um, I wanna ask about loan offers. So the, you know, the loans that a student and or, you know, the parents are offered as part of a financial aid award package. Um, so one question I have is, it, and I, I kind of alluded to this a little earlier, and, and you may have answered it in part, but um, if a student is, is offered multiple types of loans, and, and let's just say the family, and let's include the parents, if the family is offered multiple types of loans in a single award offer, is it, does the student or the family have to accept all of it or can it be like a partial acceptance depending on like, uh, let's say I only want to accept the subsidized loans but not the unsubsidized loans because I don't want to accrue uh, interest while I'm in school. Absolutely, yes. They can, they can 
take only what they need. So if they don't need the unsub because they don't want to pay the interest or whatever, they just don't need it, they can certainly um, decline it. And you just tell the school that you don't want it and they'll take it off the award letter. So, okay, yes. Great. And then, you know, along similar lines, but a little further down the line, let's say a student gets um, the financial aid award package and is offered um, loans and just accepts the full package or, you know, even just accepts part of it. But so then a little further down the road, let's say, um, you know, the student realizes they don't need to use the full loan. Is it possible to return or, or cancel the, the, the loans? They can, but it is highly recommended that if you know ahead of time before you, before the loan is dispersed um, to not accept the part that you don't want. If the whole loan was dispersed, let's say, and then you decide that you don't need a portion of it, certainly the school will be more than happy to send it back. But what happens is the, um, when it comes to looking at um, repayment, they're gonna look at the full amount when they, okay? I, I don't even know how else to explain it other than that. So it's better to not take it, um, tell the school right away, you don't need it. And then get it later if you have to, if you need it, then you can always apply, you know, always ask for it later. But once it's dispersed, Yes, they can return the funds, but that loan is going to be looked at as the full loan when you go into repayment. So that's what you want to keep in mind. It's a little tricky, but um, just I would always say make sure you know exactly before it's dispersed. Great. Okay. So uh, a couple more topics I wanted to get to. Uh, we have about 12 minutes left. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, what is unique to the times we're living in right now. Um, you know, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of just want to ask you about the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on all of this. Um, you know, we know that the college admissions landscape has changed in a lot of ways. Um, there are many things that are different about how um, high school students are applying to college, um, among a lot of other things. You know, uh, there's hardly anything that the pandemic hasn't touched, you know, in our lives. Um, but, you know, first, I just wanted to ask you um, specifically about um, a question related to financial aid award offers. So because we know many colleges are struggling financially, um, you know, during the pandemic, does it make sense to expect that the financial aid award offers for um, fall 2021 and maybe even beyond are gonna be smaller than usual? Is that a reasonable expectation? I would have to say no. I would have to say it wouldn't be any less. Um, you know, I mean, I know schools are trying to do the best they can for their families to make sure that they can come because you have different schools doing different things. Some are virtual um, and, you know, parents don't like paying a full tuition price if the student's going to be virtual or and some of them have the, the two virtual and in class. Um, but I would, you know, it's, it's hard to really even figure out what schools are going to do because I think sometimes they don't quite know what's going to happen. Right. And um, so again, it, it does depend on the school, but they do want to at least have this, be able to give enough funds for the student to come to school or, you know, whether it's virtual. I, I'll just insert this really quickly. Be, I've been reading that there are a number of institutions that are going to reduce their tuition because of the decision of, you know, if, they, if the student is virtual, then they're not obvious. They could be living in, in on campus, but all their classes are virtual. Um, but some of these schools are going to start giving 10, maybe 15% discount on their tuition. Some are going to freeze their tuition, uh, which is a very positive thing. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it really is unpredictable and it's really, it's, and 
I, I don't mean to be negative because I always am a positive person, but you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. You just don't. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But that, I mean, that's a good development that you mentioned about, um, you know, tuition being reduced. Um, you know, I, I remember reading, uh, you know, a few months back, maybe over the summer that, or maybe even towards the beginning of the, the fall term, um, there was, I feel like there was kind of an outcry about um, some of the Ivy League schools that were starting with online classes, and but um, not giving any uh, refunds, I want to say, in tuition for the, the incoming classes. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it is a very tricky, very complicated state of things right now. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it, is there anything else you would say as far as um, how the pandemic has affected uh, financial aid? that, you know, that, that's worth mentioning? Well, I would say that schools are seeing a higher uh, number of appeals that are being sent to the, you know, from the student or from the family, because um, the information that's put on to the FAFSA, FAFSA application is two years prior. So, of course, a couple of years ago, things were good, but now we're all living in a different world and a number of people have been laid off or furloughed or whatever it is um, from their jobs, been affected by COVID themselves. So appeal is the best way a family can reach out to the school and ask for additional funding. And appeal, the appeal process is similar to most to most schools, but you want to find out how that process works. And they usually have it on their website. If you want to appeal your uh, financial aid package, this is what you should do, or give them a call. You can call the financial aid office, speak to an administrator, and they'll let you know what you should do. But that is the best way. And they're really taking these very seriously, obviously, because two years ago, things were great for most people. And now we're really living in a world where people just don't have the income um, or they haven't been able to save for their child or whatever it is, so. So, so it's probably safe to say then that any, any family who has had um, a reduction in their income since the 2019 tax year mm -hmm. may just automatically want to plan to appeal. Um, and, Right. I, I'm one that really advocates for appealing. Um, the worst the school can say is no, they're not going to take back what they offered the student. Mm -hmm. The worst they can say is no. But um, as soon as you know that, uh, especially if you're doing the FAFSA and you're doing 2019, I'm sorry, 2019 income, and now we're in 2020, and you um, things are so much different, let them know right away that I really need, you know, what I'm putting on the FAFSA is completely different than what our family is going through right now. So the earlier you can appeal it, um, of course, you can't appeal before you get a financial aid package, but, you know, let the school know right away that things are quite different. So, mm -hmm. and they may say, send me an information that it relates to you into, you know, this year versus 19, you know, to 2019, so. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to kind of reiterate something you said, which is that um, the worst they can do is say no. Um, they're not going to retract uh, their previous offers. So in other words, you don't have anything to lose other than the effort that you're putting into to making the appeal. So um, yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty strong um, recommendation for, um, you know, if you have a, a reason to believe that your appeal would be considered to, to go ahead and try it. Um, right. I, that was something I did a lot of is appeals. And those, uh, they're called professional judgments. And um, most of the cases where there's a complete difference or, you know, loss of job, things like that, that would be a special circumstance. And certainly financial aid administrators do want to have, they don't know unless you tell them. So when you tell them, they're, most of them are going to be very happy to help out and see what they can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, 
similar note to um, making appeals because you know that, that's something that, as you mentioned, you would have to do once you get the financial aid award offer. Um, I just want to ask um, a couple things if we have time here about um, financial aid award offers. Um, so actually receiving those, those offers from colleges. Um, and I don't want to ask you anything that's going to take a really long answer. Unfortunately, I don't want to um, put you into a, a bind like that. But um, are there any factors that you would, you would say parents and students should really think about when they're, way, when they're looking at the various um, award offers they've received and trying to decide, you know, um, trying to factor that into which, which college to go to? Yes, of course, um, what I would, when you're looking at your award packages, the first thing you, you don't wanna look at the bottom line. Okay, wow, look how much they gave me. But how much of that is grant funds, state grants, maybe your Pell Grant eligible, other kinds of funding that you don't have to pay back and that would be gift aid, okay? So scholarships, grants, Pell Grant, SCOG, um, state grants, any of that, that's what you wanna see is, do I have any of those? Um, work study is a great thing to have on your award letter, but you have to earn it. So it doesn't come off the bill, you don't get money up front, but you have to earn it. So you got to get a job once you get on, you know, onto the campus and, and things like that. So when you're comparing your award letters, make sure you're looking at what each of them are offering. You know, is there just a little bit of, uh, of loans, like the subsidized and the unsub? Um, make sure there's not a plus loan that's been stuck in there to show that, oh, we met 100% of your need, but they use the plus loan to use, you know, to show that I've met 100%. Mm -hmm. There are schools that will add the plus loan. I, I'm not in, in favor of that, um, of schools doing that, because plus loans, maybe a parent isn't eligible, they don't need it, or they don't want it. So, um, so make sure you look line for line. What is it that they're giving me? Mm -hmm. so. Great, okay. And um, let's see, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I guess kind of just looking forward, you know, cause I know we have some, um, some parents who will be watching this or are watching this who have some younger um, children as well. Like you may have a senior this year, you may also have some, some younger students. So I'm just curious for um, families or for parents with younger students, um, do you have any advice for how to plan ahead? What, could, what can they do before senior year to help prepare for um, being able to pay for college? The first thing would be, can you save? Can you put away even $10 a week or a month? Um, saving something is better than not saving anything. And I know during these times, it's hard for a lot of families, but can if you can save through um, a 529 plan or any other type of um, savings plan for education would be a great help for, for families. Um, doing early scholarship searches, starting early, seeing what's out there. So when the time comes, the student is ready to apply for those scholarships. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, those are the two biggest things, I think, just the saving and, and, lo and looking, searching for scholarships. Um, and then if this, and also for the student that's a high school student, doing well during high school, keeping your grades up. Um, so, and getting involved maybe in community service or um, some activities that interest the students so that it looks good on their school resume when they apply for colleges. All this helps um, when admission counselors are making their decisions, obviously, they like to say, oh, wow, look at this student's been involved in this. And you know, it's better to be involved in one area, one interest than be involved in 10 interests and the student could care less about it. So it's better to be involved in one, maybe two. And that looks better on the resume for sure. And especially doing well in school. Well, you don't have to be a straight A student, but doing well. Yeah, that's great advice. 
Well, this has been extremely uh, informative. Um, thank you so much. We're, we're so grateful for um, your time and, and for being able to share, um, you know, on all these different topics. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, William, for having me. I appreciate it. And um, I, uh, good luck to all, all the families that are watching. <laughs> so. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in and just be on the lookout in the future for uh, more Strive to Learn webinars coming up and uh, so stay well.